Bible, I want you to open up to the book of Luke. We're going to be in Luke chapter 9 this morning. We're covering one verse this morning. Actually, only three words out of one verse this morning. But it starts with this question for everybody in the room. How many of you in the room want to be closer to God? Good. All right, so how many of you in the room want to be more like Christ? Only about half, okay. All right. How many of you want to move in the power of the Holy Spirit? Yes. Yeah, okay, well, we got a more going there. Yay, Holy Spirit. Okay, cool. So, um, um, how many of you in the room are guys? Uh, I'm not going to ask those two gentlemen that didn't raise their hand, okay? I'm just not going to ask. Okay, listen, I'm a guy, and, and this is what guys want. They want a question and they want to find an answer. They want to fix it. They want to know how. They want to move forward. They want to get past it. And and so the question for me this morning is, how do I get into the power of the Holy Spirit? How do I get more Christ-like? How do I get closer to God? And so I'm one of those kind of guys that just wants to go find the answer in Scripture. Because if I have the answer, I'll do it. I just need to know what to do. So we're looking at Luke chapter 9, verse 23. If you got it, say, I got it. If you don't, say, wait. Oh, we got a few weights. Okay, Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 23. Jesus is speaking here. And it says, then he, Jesus, said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up the cross and follow me. Now, I'll be honest with you, the vast majority of time that this scripture is preached, what it's preached is about taking up your cross, Right? We, we hear about what it means to take up your cross, and, and, and honestly, that's exactly what he's talking about, being able to take up your cross. But in taking up your cross, there's something else he tells you you must do to take up your cross. You must deny yourself to be able to take up your cross. Now, now truth be told, uh, the crucifixion was the method of uh, 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 death at that time. It was how they sentenced people to death and they crucified. So uh, it's not about the cross itself. It's about taking up, dying to ourselves and following him. But he says you must deny yourself. How do I deny me? Now, we've been talking the last three weeks about the difference in the spirit, the soul, and the body. And the soul, the mind, the will, the emotion. That's me. That's us. That's the one that I'm battling. I know my spirit is in line with Holy Spirit and speaks to me and directs me. And I'm my, my flesh and my soul, they're constantly wanting to be contrary to that. We learned last week that the spirit and the flesh are in conflict. So if I'm going to deny myself, what I'm denying is my mind, my will, and my emotions, and my physical body. He says you've got to deny those things because you're in agreement with those things. They're going to lead you away from the spirit. So if I'm going to deny something, watch this, I cannot be in agreement with something I'm going to deny. You know what I'm saying? I I, I can't want to date that girl and not like that girl. Okay, so if I'm going to deny it, I cannot be in agreement with it. The beauty is, if you look at that word agreement, we have a couple words in the Bible that actually express that. It's called contract or covenant. We're under a covenant with the Lord. There was an old covenant and there's a new covenant. And if you look up the word contract or covenant, both of them will tell you the definition is an agreement. It's when two people come together and they agree on something. So there was a law that God brought. It was a covenant. We call it the old covenant. He brought us to it and and he said, hey, you're under the law. Now listen to me. If there is no law, you can't break the law. Okay? Uh, So in in Romans, it talks about, uh, Romans 5.13 says, For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. What does he mean by that? What he means is, if you and I were to go out on the I-95 out here, and they were to take the speed limit signs down, just take them down, and say, go. How fast could we go? However fast you want to go. Why? Because there is no law. But if there is a law then we're breaking the law if we go over that speed limit. So God puts in a law on his people, uh, 614 sets of guidelines. And he says, this is the law that I want you to come under. Now, what did the law do? The law told us what is sin in God's eyes. Grab that. The law told us what is sin in God's eyes. 
I've expressed this to you before that I have daughters and, and when they lived at my house, there was a law. It was dad's law. And the law was you had to be in the house by 11 o'clock. That was dad's law. Sometimes they liked that law, sometimes they didn't like that law, but it was the law. And if you were out past 11 o'clock, then there was a consequence because then dad had to step in because you broke the rule. Now, as they grow up, the law becomes something I'm teaching them at home so that when they're out on their own, they begin to understand why I had that rule. And so they call me up one night after they've moved out of my house when they're not under the law anymore, they're under grace and favor, and they call me up and they say, hey, dad, I just wanted you to know I got in by 11 o'clock tonight because I know you love that, dad. I know that's your rule, but I, you know, I don't live at your house anymore, but I know this is how you feel about things, so I got in by 11. I did, however, on my way home, pass a lady in the rain who ran out of gas, who was putting her baby in a stroller to go a half a block to get some gas. But dad, I didn't stop because I knew you would want me home by 11. And I'm looking at that kid and saying, you completely missed the concept of my law. I wasn't giving you the law to be this rule that was a burden to your back. I was giving you this law to teach you how to use that law. So that law comes into place in Galatians 3.24. If we go to Galatians 3.24, this is what it says. Therefore, the law has become our, what? Tutor, our teacher. The law, the purpose of the law was to identify sin, and it came to be a teacher or a tutor to us so that, my favorite words in the Bible, so that we could be justified by faith. Now, what does he mean by that? Okay, justified, easy way to remember, just as if I justified, just as if I'd never sinned. If I'm justified before God, it's as if I never did anything wrong. If I go into court and I got a speeding ticket, but I get justified in the, in, the situ, in the issue, then I'm not guilty anymore, okay? Just as if. Now, what he said was, I gave you the law and the set of rules to know what sin is to lead you to being able to walk in faith in Christ. But you've got to come out from under that law or you're going to abide by that law for the rest of your life. Watch this. Go to Galatians 3.10. Galatians 3.10. For as many as are aware of the works of the law are under a curse. For it's written, cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. So if you're under the law, you got to obey all the law. If you break any of the law, then you've broken the law. 11. Now that no one is justified by the law before God is evident, for the righteous man will live by faith. However, the law is not faith. On the contrary, he who practices them will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it's written, curse is everyone who hangs on the tree. In order that Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham. What is the blessing of Abraham? That the righteous will live by faith. Yeah. So what he's saying is uh, we... Um, in order that Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham, might come to us, the Gentiles, so that we would receive the Spirit through faith. So what did he just say? I put the law in place to teach you how to walk in faith in Christ. And then Jesus died so that curse could be broken off of you. And, you know, I hear people say, well, doesn't it say that not one jot and tittle of the law will go away? Uh, and, and so it has to be in place now. Listen to me. What that scripture is saying is not one jot or tittle of the law will go away. Why? Because it's still a tutor. It still leads you to faith in Christ. It has to be around. If it's not around, I don't know what God considers sin. So I have to have the law. It has to remain always since it's broken me from the curse of being under that law. So now the law has to be so I know what God considers sin so that when I move out and I'm on my own and I think about this 11 o'clock rule, I know dad would want me to stop and help that lady more than he would want me at home by 11 o'clock. I've grown up. I understand how to walk in faith of Christ and ask him on the way home, do I need to be home by 11 or do I need to help this lady? And the loving Christ is going to say, help the lady. Mm, some of you are going to struggle with that, but I need you to hang in there. Because if you're going to live under the law, we just read that you have to keep every bit of it out or you've broken it anyways. And the fact that Christ has broken that curse of the law off of you says that now you walk by faith, but you still got your teacher here. You still got the tutor here. You still understand what sin is, but now you've got to walk it out by faith. So if I'm under agreement 
with what is called the law, I must abide by all the rules of the law because I'm in agreement with it. If I come under that Old Testament contract, if I come under the contract or the covenant of the law, then I've got to live by the rules and abide by the rules of the law. If I'm under the agreement of grace, if I'm under the agreement of grace through faith or faith from grace uh, that Christ brought me, then I live in a place where I must abide in Christ in faith. No, I got to say it again because some people are looking at the ceiling and some people are like, what? If I'm under the law, I have to abide by the rules of the law. If I'm under grace in Christ, I have to abide in Christ and walk by faith. Amen. Now, do you think walking in faith is contrary to the law? No. no. I'm still walking in faith, but now I'm asking Holy Spirit, give me direction. Let me know how to walk in this. Christ in me walks instead of, what was rule number 712? Well, there wasn't one. Let's go back to 512. There's a 512. Okay. So anything I'm in agreement with. So here's my question for you this morning, because this is where we're going. Anything I'm in agreement with, I can't deny it. But if I'm not in agreement with it, I can deny it. What are you in agreement with? What are you in agreement with? Let me, let, me, let me throw some things out there that you might be. And here's how you would measure whether or not you were in agreement with it. If I'm in agreement with it, I can't deny it. It's part of my life. It's something I do. If I'm not in agreement with it, I deny it. It's not part of me. I walk away from that. Are you in agreement with debt? No. Ouch. Did I say all debt was bad? No. I said the question is, are you in agreement with the burden and the bondage of debt? Are you in agreement with immorality. No. Do you let it in your life? Do you not? Are you in agreement with illness? No. Are you in agreement with victimization? No. Are you in agreement with fear? No. Are you in agreement with anger? No. How about infertility? How about religion? No. How about pain? No. My question is, you can't deny something that you're in agreement with. So these are things we know we don't want to be in agreement with. We don't want to be in contract with those kind of things. What we want is what God has for us. We want to be in agreement with the things of God. I want to deny myself and turn to accept the agreements that he's brought to me, that he is bringing to me. So I'm in agreement with God says, I have to know what Christ has given me. I have to be in agreement with those things. So I go back to my original statement. How do I become more like Christ? Because he wasn't in agreement with those things. He was in agreement with the things of God. Well, I'll tell you where I get that answer as a guy. It's in 1 John 2.6. 1 John 2.6. The one who says he abides in him, Christ, ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. Now, just at a baseline, what he just said was, if you're in Christ, you ought to be walking the walk Christ walked. Well, that's easy, isn't it? No. It, it's, it's actually not. But what I can do is go look at what manner did Christ walk, and can I walk that walk? Now, that can mean a lot of things, and I could spend probably an entire series of six or eight weeks on this, but today, I just want to look at three ways that Christ walked, in the manner that he walked in three different ways, three places that he walked out. One, he walked out the wilderness. One, he walked out the garden, and one he walked out the cross. And if I'm going to be like Christ, if I'm going to be close to God, if I'm going to have the power of the Spirit, then I need to walk out the way he walks. So let's go first to the wilderness. It's in Matthew chapter 4. Matthew 4. You can turn there. Matthew 4. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. That makes sense. And the tempter came and said to him, if you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. And he answered and said, it's written, man doesn't live by bread alone, but he lives by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up to a holy city and said to him, stand on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, you're the son of God, throw yourself down for it's written, you'll command his angels concerning you. And on the hands, they will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. And Jesus says to him, listen, on the other hand, it's written, you don't put the Lord your God to a test. 
Again, the devil, he took him to a very high mountain. He showed him the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to them, all these things I'll give to you if you'll fall down and worship me. And Jesus said, go, Satan, because it's written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only will you serve. And the devil left him. Listen to me. When we go through the wilderness, our deeds are, are tested. Jesus is led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil to see what his deeds would be. What do I mean by seeing what his deeds would be? Listen, when he went into the, uh, to the, uh, the wilderness, uh, he was asked to turn stones to bread because he was hungry. Now watch. He had to deny himself his hunger and say, I will not do what you've asked me to do, Satan. So Satan takes him up to a high place and says, why don't you jump off of this thing because it's written that you're going to be taken care of if you do. Jesus says, okay, I could show the power and might of my father and how much he loves me right now, but I'm going to deny myself that testing of God and I'm not going to do it. And then Satan says, hey, I, I got an idea for you. Uh, why don't you come and bow down before me? And if you bow down before me, I'll give you all of this world. And Christ could look around and say, well, I could have all of this. It could be mine. Or he could deny his own desire, deny himself and say, I'm not going to bow down to you. So when you go through the wilderness time, your deeds get tested. Why do your deeds get tested? Because when your deeds get tested, your heart is revealed. Y'all stay right here. <laughs> When you go to the wilderness and your deeds get tested, your heart is revealed. Okay, I don't always know what I'm in agreement with. Uh, I got to get you involved here. Men, when pornography comes up on your computer, what are your deeds? It tests your heart. Do I want to stay and look or do I want to turn this thing off and get out of here? Do I want to flee that youthful lust? The heart gets exposed uh, and it shows you what you're in agreement with. So if I'm afraid, if something comes into my life that would threaten me, I can show that I'm in agreement by fear by acting afraid and cowering back and saying, oh, this is going to overwhelm me. I need to be a victim here. I'm coming into agreement with fear. Uh, if I'm coming into agreement with anger, the situation approaches me. I don't have the peace of God. I get angry. I yell. I hit. I do whatever. I'm coming into agreement with anger. And I don't want to be in agreement because it's testing my heart. Because what comes out of the heart, whew, come on. So Jesus shows when you're trying to get me, Satan, to recognize my hunger, I will not do the deed of turning the rock into bread. When you're trying to get me to show how much God loves me, I will not do the deed to test him. I know of his love for me. When, when I'm tempted to give, be given the whole world, I will not do the deed of bowing down to you. So in the wilderness, and listen, you've been there, right? This stuff comes at you. And sometimes we fall to it and we say, why did I do that? Why? Because in my heart, I'm in agreement with it. Amen. What happens when I deny this over and over and over? You guys know this. Every time I deny myself, I, it gets easier to deny those things. Every time I deny it, I get stronger. I, I love the fact that in this verse, not my notes, but this is for free, okay? Uh, in verse 4, Jesus responds when he says, eat the bread. He says, man doesn't live by bread alone, but he lives on every word that proceeds. proceeds. Not proceeded. Amen. Proceeds out of the mouth of God. Man, you and I live by what God is saying now. And the more and more he talks to you, the more and more comfortable you get with following, the more trusting you get. Why? Because that repetitiveness helps. Now listen, he leaves the wilderness. He leaves the wilderness. But I want you to see what the difference was when he left the wilderness. Go to Luke 4. Luke 4, 14. Jesus returned to Galilee. This is directly after the wilderness experience. He returns to Galilee, but watch how he's described now. He returned to Galilee in the power of the Holy Spirit. 
When did the Holy Spirit come upon him? When he was baptized. He came out, the Spirit descended on him and led him into the wilderness. And he was tempted and he became strong in the wilderness. I don't know if you're getting that. He became strong when he became tempted. He became strong in the power of the Spirit when he was tempted. And news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. We call that favor. Everybody was hearing and knowing about this Jesus. He was teaching in their synagogue and everyone praised him. Come on. You cannot get the power of the Holy Spirit without your heart being tested. Without your deeds being tested. To find out what you're in agreement with. Mm. So the agreement has to be established first with God. Uh, Do I know the word of God? Do I recognize the enemy's schemes? Man, just look up that word in the Bible. Scheme. You'll find it's always connected with the devil, and it's always a crafty plan to make you fall. It means that the devil is actually making plans to trip you up. It's a scheme. It's a scheme of the devil. His job is to find a way to trip you up. So I got to be able to recognize those schemes. Is my total allegiance and my heart with God? Do I deny myself for the agreement with God? Uh, Will I agree with my deeds being in agreement with? with God. That's what the wilderness does. Check your deeds. It shows your hearts. When your heart has been tested and your deeds have been tested, you can come out with the power of the Spirit. Now he goes to another place, another journey, another manner that he walked. He went to the place called the garden. Jesus went to the place of the garden. And listen, when you get to the garden in your life, now what gets tested is your will. In the desert, It's your deeds to reveal your heart. In the garden, it's your will that gets tested. Luke 22, 39. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, pray that you won't fall into temptation. And he withdrew about a stone's throw away and he knelt down and he prayed. Now listen, this prayer is a conversation between God and Jesus on earth. Got it? Listen to this prayer. Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me. This is Jesus saying, I don't want to do this. Take this away from me. Find another way. I don't want to go through this brutalization. I don't want to go through this crucifixion. I don't want to go through the wrath being poured out on me. This is Jesus asking God Please, can we find another way? If you'll remember in the garden, he went back three times and he prayed for an hour each time and the only input we have on what he prayed was, Father, take this cup away from me. So you're thinking, should we be okay that Jesus is saying I don't want to go to the cross? Listen to me. If it wasn't difficult, it wasn't a sacrifice. Okay, so this is Jesus saying, this is brutal, this is hard, this is difficult, knowing that your wrath is going to be poured on me. If there is another way, God, I want to do it another way. And then there's this amazing little three-letter word, yet. Not what I want, not my will, but yours be done. I'm telling you, I don't want to go through this, but if it's your desire, God, to do it, then I I will go through this. I don't want to, but I will. My will says, let's find another way. But God, if your will says, this is the only way, then let's do that. Anybody know or have a strong-willed child? We know what that's like, right? Not going to change their mind. Insistent, going forward. And we know uh, that that there's some aspects of that we kind of like. Oh, they're going to be successful. They're going to have a great drive. They're going to be able to do a lot of things. But here's the truth. That strong will often comes in as a problem for us. And all of us have a strong will. That self-will says, I'm looking out for myself. I want what's best for me. I need this kind of protection, this kind of safety. I have a will. If you don't remember anything else I say about the garden, please remember this statement. Whatever breaks your will, gets the power to direct you. Let me say it again. Whatever breaks your will, gets the power to direct you. You know this about horses. 
Horses don't like to be broken. How do I know they don't like to be broken? Because they buck and they jump and they kick and they do not want to be ridden. But listen to me. When their will gets broken by the master, they're easy to direct. Amen. Thank you for getting that, Cheryl. That's awesome. <laughs> when your will gets broken by the master, you are easy to direct. When I would submit my will, what I want in all of this, to God, it becomes very easy for God to direct me. That person riding the horse takes a couple leather straps and moves them to the left, moves them to the right, and the horse goes. Why? Because the will is broken by the master, and now it's easy to follow. It's easy to lead. The direction channel becomes simple because now it's not about me. It's about you, and where do you want to go with me? So I take direction easily because it's not my will. I have denied myself and I've taken up the death of giving you my will and following your will for me. Now I become easy to direct. That's a really good thing. So Jesus goes from the garden to the cross. So in the wilderness, his deeds get tested. And, and then he goes into the garden. Uh, I'm sorry, in the wilderness, his deeds get tested. He goes to the garden and his will gets tested. And then he goes to the cross. Now, now honestly, I, I don't want to look past this one point. He's going to the cross, but he has already had his will broken. So when his will was broken, the cross was, in, it, it was set in stone. It was going to happen. Why? Because it's no longer Jesus' will but God's. But something happens at the cross that has to happen for each of us. We have to go through the wilderness and get our deeds tested so we know what our heart is in agreement with. And then we have to go to the garden and we have to know that our will gets broken by the Father's will and we submit and get easily directed by the Father. But when we go to the cross, I'm denying my past and I'm commencing my future. Uh, just, just consider it this way. Uh, the old Jesus... The one that was in the flesh was crucified so that the greater Jesus, the glorified one, could live. Listen, the lesser you, the lesser you has to die so that the greater you can move forward. The lesser you has to die. The greater you doesn't come out until the lesser you is crucified. Come on, come on. Listen. I'll show you in a real simple term. Jesus, before his crucifixion, he knew what it was like to be tired and weary and hungry. He knew what it was like to be tempted. He knew what it was like to be mocked. He knew what it was like to suffer pain. He knew what it was like to die. That's the Jesus before crucifixion. It's the lesser Jesus because he's in the form of man. But after the crucifixion, he returns in a glorified state. He goes to sit at the right hand of the Father. All power and authority comes underneath him. He is the King of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He's the Redeemer. He's the Savior. He pays the full price for us. He lives on in glory. He prepares a place for you. Listen, if we never saw the greater Jesus, we'd all be in our lesser state. <clears throat> Galatians 2.20 Here's how it applies to us today. You've heard this scripture many, many times. I'm going to read it once and I'm going to show you something maybe you haven't seen. I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. But Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I want to show you something. You are the four eyes. You are. All of you are four eyes. Okay. I, I wear glasses so I can say that. Here's the four eyes. I, the first eye, the one that has to die. I have been crucified. It is my destiny to die to myself. That is the I before because at the end of this scri uh, scripture, we got another I we're dealing with. But the I before is the one that has to get crucified. And then he says, I no longer live. I must die. 
The second eye, the first eye, the one that needs to be crucified. The second eye, the one that no longer lives. I'm dead. The old man is dead. The third eye, the life I now live in the body. I now live in the body. He's telling you, I'm still here in the flesh, but I'm a different eye than I was before. I'm living now in a different life. Even though you look at me and you see the same guy, I no longer live in the flesh. The life I now live in the body is different. I, the fourth I, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Do you see that there's a different I at the end than there was at the beginning? And the four stages were, I got to be crucified, I got to die, I'm still in the flesh, but now Christ is in me and I live through that faith in Christ. So all of us need to go through that four I process. We must be crucified and deny ourselves. We must die to the lesser person we were before. We must know that now we live with Christ in us. And when Christ is in us, we can walk by faith, not under a law, but under the grace of the Savior. And we walk forward in the kingdom. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, but it's not me. It's Christ living in me. It's a different me. It's a new me. It's a new I. Why? Because I'm no longer in agreement with the past. I walk in a way now where I'm getting over who I used to be. I walk in a way now where I'm moving to something I've never had before. I walk in a way now where I'm in full relationship and righteous with the Father. I walk in a way where I'm in the kingdom of God. I walk in the way where I am a warrior. I'm under a new agreement. The old covenant is gone. The new covenant has come. And I walk by faith in Jesus Christ. Mm. So what you saw today in baptism is actually the physical picture of what we're talking about today. Uh, this being Palm Sunday week where we know that Friday of this week we celebrate a crucified Savior. And next week when we come together we're going to talk about that resurrected Savior. But there has to be a crucifixion in order for there to be a new life. And it's said this way in Romans 6. Romans 6, 3 through 6. Or do you not know that all of us who were baptized into Jesus Christ have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we've been buried. Listen, you got to be dead to be buried. Or it's really bad. <laughs> Therefore, we've been buried with him into death so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in a newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, surely also we will be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, watch, our old self was crucified with him in order that our body might be done away with so that we would no longer be what? Slaves. To sin. Now watch this. If I am a slave, I am under contract to an owner. I am in agreement with it because I act as a slave. I walk as a slave. I'm treated as a slave because I have a contract and I'm in agreement with being a slave. And he says, you're no longer going to be a slave to sin. I'm no longer going to be in agreement with sin. I'm no longer going to be in a contract with sin. I'm looking at a new agreement. The new agreement where the scripture says, blessed is the man whose sin is not imputed to him. Why? Because Christ came, removed the curse from me, died for my sin, and then said, walk with me by faith. And I'll show you a new life. I'll show you a new way to walk. I'll show you how you walk into the kingdom. I'll show you the new agreements we have for your abundant life. I'll show you the new agreements we have for your power and your authority. I'll show you how the Holy Spirit speaks to your spirit speaks to your soul, directs you. I'll show you how, what it means to walk in faith by being able to say, I know what's coming. Why? Because the Holy Spirit's already revealed it to me so I can walk by faith. I, I understand what it means in, in 1 Corinthians 2 when he says, the spirit, my eye hasn't seen it, my ear hasn't heard it, my heart hasn't even got it yet. What the uh, Holy Spirit is revealing to my spirit so that I can know the things of God. Why is it that God will give you the desires of your heart? Because listen to me, God gives you the desires. So if God gives you the desire in your heart, then God will give you the desires of your heart so that you know what to pray for and you know what to walk out. So many of us walk around saying, well, the desire of my heart's a new car and God's not giving me a new car, so this doesn't work. Listen, the Spirit gives you the desire. And the desire may be 
share something with this friend of yours. Go financially help a buddy. Uh, here, I've got a blessing for you in a new house and it's coming. So don't worry that you don't have the money yet, but it's going to come to you. It's okay. When God places that desire, when he gives me the desire, then I can walk out that desire. Then I can walk in faith. Why? Because he's given me the desire in my heart and I can walk that thing out. So now we have to look at what are you in agreement with? Are you in agreement with what God has given you through Christ? Are you still in agreement with the world and Satan to be tempted and to be brought down and to be a slave to sin? That's a yes or no question. <laughs> Here's my point today. We started with Luke 9.23. And he said to them all, if you want to be my disciple, you must deny yourself. You must deny yourself. I must deny what's of me and only be in agreement with what's of God. I must stop telling myself I'll never get any better. I must stop telling myself I'll never get married. I must stop telling myself I'll never have a child. I must stop telling myself I'll never be out of debt. I must stop telling myself that I'm just going to have to live a life of pain. I must stop telling myself these things because those I'm not in agreement with. Those are things of Satan. Those are not the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven because those things aren't in heaven and we want the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. So I don't want those things. Here's what I want. I want love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, self-control. I want the prosperity, not, not because I want physical money. I'm not that guy. But I want a prosperity in my heart that says I'm at peace with the fact that I'm taken care of by my God. So I don't have to worry about things. I just walk it through and I wait for him to lay the desire in my heart and I move forward. I walk in agreement with the things of the kingdom so then I can see in the scripture what comes to life in my life and I can walk that out. And listen to me, the same way you get tested to find out that fear or debt is in your heart, you can get tested to find out that love, joy, peace, patience, yeah. kindness, self good all of those are in your heart. Why? Because when I'm faced with the situation, what comes out? Peace. What comes out? Love for someone else. They come and attack me, but I say, hey, brother, I don't want to fight with you. Let's find a way to get this resolved and get on down the road. Why? Because that's what's in my heart. Because that's the agreement I have. I'm not agreement with the stuff of sin anymore. Close your eyes for just a moment. Question of the day. Same thing we ended with in the first service. Are you in right standing with God right now? In this place, in this room, are you in right standing? When I say right standing, if today was the day that God said, it's over, your life is over, would you be with him in heaven or would you be separated from him eternally? So you probably got one of three answers. One is, yes, I know I would be with God. Two, I don't know, I'm not sure. Or three, pretty sure no. Listen to me. You can know the answer is yes. How do you know the answer is yes? Because right now you're being extended an invitation by the Holy Spirit. He's going to convict your heart. He's going to talk to you and he's going to explain to you that God created all of us. That he created a world and he said, you guys can have dominion over it. You can enjoy the fruit of it. You can, be, you can multiply. It's all yours. Just keep your faithfulness to me and don't eat from this tree. What did we do? We came into agreement with Satan that it was okay to eat from that tree. And sin came into the world and it broke our relationship with God. And scripture says that every one of us do it. Every one, me, you, all of us, we sin. There's an accountability for that sin. There's a consequence for that sin. It's called eternal separation from God. And yet God, from the very moment that Adam and Eve did that, came to them and said, I will set up a way for you to restore your relationship with me. Here's what it is. I will send Jesus Christ to the earth. He will take the punishment for everything you've done wrong, every law you've broken, every sin that you've done. He will come. He will be brutalized. He will be beaten. He will be hung on a cross. He will die. I will pour my wrath out on him. And he will endure the separation that was due for you. And he says, my God, why have you forsaken me? As God is pouring out my sin on Jesus. And Jesus is taking that punishment and that consequence. Then he dies and if he had just died, everybody would have said, what a great guy that died. But he didn't stay dead. He came back. He rose from the dead to show me there is a life after this one. When this body is dead, there is a resurrected life after this one. He came back to guarantee me it happens. 
Now, how do I grab a hold of that rightness with God? God made it very simple. He said, repent and believe. What does it mean to repent? Repent means I'm going to change my mind. That's what the Greek metaneo word means. I'm going to change my mind. Why? Because my mind used to be, if I pray every day, if I read my Bible, if I go to a good church, I'm going to be saved. But scripture says, when I recognize I have broken my relationship with God and the only way, truth, and life is Jesus Christ and no one gets to the Father except through Him, I recognize that I need what He did for me on the cross. And then I begin to believe. I believe that Jesus died for me. He took a punishment for me. Let that come into your heart. Let it come into your soul. Listen to these words. He took all of the separation between you and God on himself. And then scripture says, he gave you a righteousness. He who knew no sin became sin, your sin, so that you might receive the righteousness, the right standing of God, which is in him, Jesus. So he takes your unrighteousness and he gives you righteousness. He takes your condemnation and he makes you whole and right before God. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory. So he gives you that righteousness so you can stand before God. What is your role? Change your mind about whatever you thought would get you to heaven. It's not the church you grew up in. It's not what they did to you. It's not the the prayer you say at night. It's Jesus on a cross taking a penalty for you and giving you righteous standing before God. And if you're willing to receive that and accept it this morning, then God says you will be eternally with him through Christ. So this is what I'm asking you. Are you right with God? Because if you're not, I encourage you right now in this moment, you don't have to come forward. I'm not going to make you stand. You don't have to do this with a pastor. This is between you and God. Maybe you'd want to have a conversation with God that's sincere and real, and you'd want to say, Father God, I get it now. I've sinned. I've broken your ways. I've done the things you told me not to. I haven't done the things you told me to do. And I realize that separated us. But today I believe, I'm putting my faith and my trust that Jesus stepped into the picture, took all of the punishment and consequence for me, gave me his right standing with you so I could walk righteously. I could walk in favor. I could walk with an eternity with you. I could walk with heaven secured. So this morning, God, I believe that for me. I receive that for me. I know that he died. I know that he rose again. I know there's a life after this. And I know that in him, I will be with you, God, forever. And I thank you for that this morning. I thank you that I understand it. I thank you that you've led me to this place to pray. I thank you that I can receive that in Jesus' name.